This is Leanne, aka Monsieur Banana. She's an influencer and self-professed sneakerhead. How many sneakers I have? Yeah. I'm actually scared to count. Oh, I'll try, so I'll start counting the ones I have like by my door because I still have them in all the boxes. And I started counting, and I was like, oh, this is like over 50 already, and this is just one section. So I stopped. So <laughs> I'm gonna say maybe at the moment, just under 200. But these sneakers are not an everyday pair used to go to the gym. These are sneakers that can sell for sometimes thousands of dollars and often don't even get worn. You may have crossed paths with sneakerheads, seen them queuing by the hundreds outside retailers. Monsieur Banana is one of those people. This was in 2016, it was in front of Up There store. It was actually my first time that I lined up for sneakers because I was so dedicated to get these Yeezy 350 Pirate Blacks and I was dedicated. So when I knew they were releasing it, I went to like a camping store, bought a camping chair and lined up. When the Yeezy hype was at its peak, people were lining up probably two or three days. I have no idea how some of these kids are affording shoes. Sneaker store manager Jaden Trainer sees kids spend hundreds of dollars at his Melbourne store every day. It seems like kids now are getting a lot into either starting jobs younger, um, also parents are just being more willing to pay for these things for their kid. They want to fit in at school, they, they want to have the things that other kids have and their parents don't want them to miss out. But how did it get like this? How did a pair of smelly, throwaway sports shoes become such a highly sought after commodity? Sneakers were basically a sporting goods equipment. Creative designer and entrepreneur Jeff Staples says the transformation began in the 1980s when Nike sought to increase its share in the basketball shoe market by signing a deal with a Chicago Bulls rookie, Michael Jordan. But then the cultural influence of sneakers started to spread beyond sport. Something happened in the early 90s. Different people who were into different elements of culture, such as music, hip hop, rock, punk rock, skateboarding, and used them not to play the sport in, but to express themselves. Chase Shield has been making customized one-off pairs of sneakers in Melbourne for over 14 years. While big corporations manufacture shoes in the hundreds of thousands, Chase still works on each pair by hand. The process of customizing a sneaker takes him on average 20 to 40 hours. The only shoe making joke I know is, um, you know, the, it's called a shoe last, so they say the last comes first. So from there it's, you know, creating the pattern off that shoe last, cutting out the pattern, cutting out the materials, stitching, and then that's where the shoe last comes in because you get the form of it. And then from there, attach the sole. Uh, it's just, yeah, kind of like putting a puzzle together really. Most of the world's sneakers are manufactured in Asia, where labour and manufacturing costs are way cheaper. Asia Pacific has always been the place where shoes get made, and it's always been an export business, right? And according to Jeff, the only thing that separates a $40 shoe from a $100,000 item at a museum is branding and storytelling. A lot of times people think that brands like Nike are not even like sneaker companies anymore, they're, they're marketing companies first. In 2003, Nike approached Jeff Staple to make a pair of sneakers dedicated to New York with what's now become the iconic Pigeon Dunk. Nike did not understand what a pigeon had to do with New York City. But sneakerheads got it right away. Some rioting broke out. Kids were sleeping outside for five days through a snowstorm. The police got involved. People were arrested. People brought weapons to try to get shoes in case they couldn't buy them at the store. And from that point, that Pigeon Dunk that I designed has become kind of like a holy grail of sneaker culture. A used pair is like 30,000 to 50,000 US dollars. A mint condition pair recently sold on Sotheby's auction house for 100,000 US dollars. The power of social media has continued to transform the sneaker industry, turning singers and rappers like Travis Scott and Kanye West into shoe designers. So I've got the Travis Scott ones here. Uh, and these, you know, these can go from anywhere from $2,000 to $3,000. What resellers are peddling is a chance to own a piece of cultural history that's exploded into a billion dollar industry, showing no signs of stopping. Some companies have begun to explore 3D printing technology, others are capitalising on the NFT market, creating virtual sneakers bought and traded as digital commodities. At the same time, Chinese brands like Antisports are on the rise, realising they not only have the manufacturing capability, but a growing number of domestic consumers and might not need Western brands anymore. There's no turning back now. We're never going to be barefoot. 